Uh, where to begin? Uh, where to begin? Let's begin with a death. Hmm? So I, I, I have a, a master's degree uh, in printmaking from Indiana University. Uh, and then I have another master's degree in sculpture and performance from Yale. And I only got to Yale by way of a death. My father died. Has anyone ever watched someone die? Your hand should go up. It's fucking beautiful. It is. If you are lucky enough to be with someone who took care of you when you couldn't take care of yourself and you take care of them on the way out, that is fucking beautiful. You wipe someone's ass because you love them. You don't even think about it. And because of that experience, I was able to go to Yale. I looked at him dying in that bed. He would cross over and come back. He would cross over in his sleep and talk about people who were already dead. You dig? And I would say to him, well, oh, man, you were talking about so and so and so and so. He would say, no, I wasn't. I'd be like, who are you going to believe, me or your lying ears? So I went to Yale because I thought to myself, well, I'm not going to be here much longer, so I might as well do what I can while I'm here. And I wanted to go. And during that experience, I met a gentleman who passed away a couple of years ago. It was my dear friend, Jack Tilton. He was my dealer. And he would say something like, oh, no, you, you, you got to go to the Met. And I'd be like, well, God damn it, Jack, I go to the Met all the time. What are you talking about? He said, but on Friday, you got to go. And I would say, why? He said, because on Fridays, it used to be open late like 10 years ago for nothing but the artists. And you could go to the Met and see all of these famous artists. And I would go. I, would, I was having my Beyonce moment, crayon or Creole crayon, is that what you said? I was having my Beyonce moment like, I would be like, oh, there's David Hammond staring at something. There's Richard Tuttle staring at something. And then I was like, why do I keep staring at these people staring at something? Why don't I all go, go find my own stuff at which to stare? So then I found myself in the medieval wing. I remember sitting in front of these tapestries for hours, mesmerized by these images and not knowing why. And then I finally realized it was, it was because even though it's the 12th century, some of these things, they're the beginning of photography. It's nothing but a one-to-one -one relationship with data. Data meaning weaving or uh, uh, fabric or uh, thread. Is everybody with me so far? I mean, even if you look at um, a Seurat painting, you know, pointillism, yeah? Those are all based off of tapestries if you ever read his uh, notebooks. Because he was studying tapestry weaving to make those things. So I would go to the Met and I would sit forever. And while sitting there, I thought, well, you know, the, the New York spirit caught me. Because what happens in New York, you never ask if it's possible. You just, you just ask, well, how am I going to do it? And when the hell am I going to get it done? And I thought to myself, well, shit, how am I going to do this? And when am I going to done? So I started reading. And while reading, I realized uh, a number of things. I realized I was seduced by the surface. Uh, I realized that weaving had a, a relationship with images that, was it this one? Um, I realized that weaving had a relationship with painting, uh, photography, and a slew of things. So I started making these weavings, um, and after making the weavings, I wasn't satisfied with them at first. So what I would do was, um, well, I started making tapestries, really. I started collaging on top of them, right? Uh, and it was collage of a lot of things, because at one time, I was the head of printmaking at uh, University of Cincinnati. And, uh, well, sh I got to move, man. I can't stand next to this mic. Shit. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Ah, very good. OK. So uh, as, as the head of uh, printmaking at Cincinnati, it was great. Uh, and I had a studio. Oh, man. That some bitch was 1,500 square feet. Yeah, if you live in New York, you're like, what? <laughs> and uh, guess how much I was paying? This is, this is a real game. Somebody yell out a number. Shut up, 1500 Nah, you're being a bugger. Huh? You better cut the price in half and double it. Go ahead. <laughs> Niall Standish. I was paying $150 a month. Yes! Oh, oh. Listen, the man had a huge factor. And he was like, we got rats. All I need is somebody to inhabit this place. And I said, I'll do it. So while I was there, I started making these, right? So I could, I could go to his basement and scrounge through all the junk he had down there and just glue it onto this tapestry. And I was able to do this like cord thing, which I thought at the time was really sexy. I was like, I'm genius. You know, sometimes you fool yourself. You're like, this is really brilliant, right? Uh, it's kind of like when you're a child or you're younger, if anyone remembers uh, CDs, you know, compact disc or cassette tapes. And you buy that album for that one song, but your friends are like, nah, bro, this song sucks. 
or this album sucks but that one song, right? But you try to convince yourself. I was convincing myself. So I did that. And I had all this space to work, right? And while I was doing that, I was hiring, um, I hired this man to make uh, these glass slides. because They don't make glass slides anymore. I'm only showing you this because this is upstairs. Uh, so you'll see, uh, oh, I can stand on the stage, yes. Uh, something like this, these glass slides, the, all these glass slides of photographs of um, black male sexual organs. <laughs> Very good. Yes, child, yes. You should have seen when my aunt came to the opening. <laughs> and she is a God-fearing woman. She's beautiful, right? And she said, oh, this is very lovely, Noel. And then she looked, she said, oh. <laughs> and she said, sister, and this is the Crete, and this is the Crete. So I was like, oh, well, if, if that charges her, I, I've got something here, right? <laughs> so in the image, I was trying to play with, uh, I think I'm going to do it right this time. There we go. I'm trying to play with the stereotype of, stereotypes associated with black masculinity. So you can't see the image itself, but in the image, there's, it's from the Fat Albert comic books, right? And, uh, yes, child. And uh, there, is a, there is a black boy, uh, no, there's a white boy on this horse, and there's a black boy uh, essentially being the servant walking the horse with the white boy on top of it. And this comes from Dr. Cosby. PhD? He's going to sell the stereotype back to me? No, sir. Not today, Satan. <laughs> so I took these narratives and tried to collapse them into space. Is everybody with me so far? Yes, yes the horse is the black male member. What is that? That's a, that's a performative. The chattel, which is the man, is carrying the chattel, which is the horse. Mm, blind leads the blind, right? And you'll know in some of the work upstairs, there's a lot of um, French and German titles. Mm. Mm. I don't read a lick of French. If I were to read that, I'd be like, stoppage, three, eat, eat, eat at, eat at, see, I can't even do it. But I love the French and the German theorists because they break us into understanding the world differently and more complexly and more uh, densely. Ah. So there's another thing that happens while I'm making those works. Hmm? Hmm? I have a really bad habit. This is the part of the show where I'm making confessions. May I, may I confess? Yes. Now nah, again, may I confess? Yes. Ah, the fucker, the fucker, the fucker. <laughs> so I like whiskey. Not a lot, just a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. Uh, a little bit. And cigars. Mm, love me a cigar. But I have another really bad habit, which is having a few drinks and then staying up late. Oh. Yes, child. And then picking that phone up and checking out eBay. <laughs> or finding auction. Don't act like y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Some of y'all doing it right now in the back, like, ooh, he sees my light. Let me turn it down. <laughs> so while I do that, um, I, was, I was going through this period where I was buying a lot of Ebony magazines. Now they're worth a lot. So I was buying like stockpiles. And in my studio at the time, I was in New Haven at Yale. I had at least three, four hundred of them. I didn't know what to do with them. So I let them sit. Uh, the reason I, I was really into the Ebony magazines was not just because I have a, a fetish for spending my own cash like an idiot. Um, doesn't, doesn't spending money feel good until you realize the rent is due and you, don't, you can't pay the fucking rent? Um, I also realized something very important about the Ebony magazines, that they were my archive. Ebony and Jet, when I was growing up, was the shit, right? I'd go to my grandmother's house, and she'd have a stack of them on a, on a beautifully placed, because uh, black women do something so beautiful with the way they just, just present things. Um, Beautifully placed in the bathroom, but don't stop there. She had a whole nother rack in the living room. Don't stop there. She had a whole nother rack in the, in the, bath, or in the, in the bedroom, right? right? And I remember the first time, uh, I'll tell you the story. May I tell you a story? Yeah. I remember the first time I saw her without her wig. <laughs> Child, please, you tell a black woman she, don't, she got that wig on, man. She done lost her mind. Because I, I, I went into the bedroom, and she had that fucking mannequin head. And the wig was, I was like, holy shit. And I was like six. <laughs> And then I went into the kitchen, and she had great plaits, and I was like, oh. And she was like, what? I was like, uh. <laughs> so then I ran back to the ebony, opened the ebony, and I found my blackness. So in that house with my grandmother, I found a lot about being black. But don't even sweat it. Don't even sweat it. You want to know why? Watch. Watch what we do. Watch what we do. Um, OK, OK. You must use your imaginations now, because this happens all the time at NYU. OK. Um, OK. Um, there was a thing that happened. Um, 
let's just imagine this is here. Okay, so this is uh, an image from a manuscript, uh, and a manuscript is a small book, uh, and they're all hand painted, uh, which is a, there's a lot of work in it. Is everybody with me so far? Okay, and I made this, re this relationship between the manuscript and the Ebony magazine, because manuscript ain't nothing but a magazine. Is everybody with me so far? And I was like, oh, the manuscripts here are so complex and they're so dense and they're about a, a ton of things that to me seem to be about power and knowledge and the structures of logic. And I was like, well, ain't that the same thing I was staring at then? You know? It's the same thing. This is a black manuscript. It just so happens that it's mass produced ad infinitum. It's a print. Okay. So in this manuscript, we're seeing uh, Richard II. Uh, in his coronation, and I'm assuming he probably paid someone to make the thing. But there's something fucking brilliant in the back of it. What do you see? Let's go there. What do you see? There we go. You fucker, you fucker, you fucker. You got there faster than I wanted you to. Mm. I thought to myself, oh, so they use the, ma I'm going to call it the magazine now. They use the magazine to replicate the power of the image of the tapestry. So this person, the king, gives it to, uh, the, the king has it woven, and then it's in his home, his castle, right? But that's not the only thing he does, right? He says, well, you gotta repeat this or replicate this thing in an image. So now he has the tapestry repainted in what I'm going to call the magazine. Is everybody with me so far? Ah, let's go to church. So, I said, well, what can I do with the Ebony magazine? What can I do? What can I do? What can I do? I realized, frankly, I know, child, I know. <laughs> don't, don't quiet our future. He is our future. He is our future. I need that child to be our future. You understand, ma'am? Very good. Um, I realized that the image wasn't real. The image can't be real because the image is flat. And real experience isn't flat, it's dimensional. Love is dimensional. Hate is dimensional. Is everybody with me so far? It's not a flat thing. There's so many complex experiences related or the ecology of, 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 of an image. So I said, well, how can I experience or think about or represent the, the, the unreality of this image? So I started erasing them. I mean, for black folks who know, you, you, when you open those magazines, they got those images or they got those advertisements about bleaching your skin changing your hair, oh, to come to church now. All these things that are telling you to change yourself and erase who you are. You understand me? Yeah. So I said, well, let's just see what we can do. Let's just erase them. And this one's upstairs in one of the uh, 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 frames. So I started erasing them. First, I did it by hand with an eraser. And I was like, yeah, man, Rauschenberg, that's cute when you, just, when you erase the de Kooning, but I ain't got time for that. Right? I guess there's, there's, that, there's that video on YouTube of the sister who, um, who, who, who called the fire department because her apartment's on fire. And then, you know, they get the sister with the rollers in her hair. They, yeah, I get it, but my mother has rollers too, but whatever. And they say, what happened, man? What happened? She's like, oh, I was, in the, I was in my bedroom. I was asleep. And I woke up and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the kitchen was on fire in the oven. And I got asthma. And she said, ain't nobody got time for that. I was like, she right. Ain't nobody got time for that. So I started figuring out a different way to do it. So I started mixing chemicals, which is very important because these all are about the chemicals that are used to change the skin of black folks and the hair of black folks. Come with me now. So I started applying my version of the chemical to the, to the image, which allowed me, one, to, to erase the image at a much more expeditious uh, rate, and it also allowed me to get, make the image more painterly. So what happens next? I don't remember. Very good. That's true. My father used to come home mad as fuck. He wasn't abusive, but goddamn, he was an angry man. Like James Baldwin's father, he was a board. And he couldn't bend, he could only be broken. And he, they broke him bad. You gotta be flexible. You, like Bruce Lee says, you gotta be like water. You must be like water. But I've had that experience before. When I was a grad student uh, trying to gain an education uh, at Indiana University, I remember walking home from my studio, perfect, at 3 in the morning, right? Because, you know, you're dedicated, you wanna be there. Uh, and I had a compact disc in one hand. I was walking across the stadium parking lot in Bloomington, Indiana. And I remember I looked up, and a police officer car was coming towards me. And I looked, and I said, shit. And another one was coming from behind, and I was like, fuck. 
And I was blessed enough to have a family. Thank you, Father and Mother. I was blessed enough to have a family that they taught me uh, when I was at the dinner table that how to negotiate those situations. And I remember when the cop said, who are you, yada, yada, yada. And I had my hands up in the air. I said, OK, I got my ID in my pocket. And he said, well, reach for it slowly. I said, I am reaching into my pocket for my wallet. And I said to him, because I don't want to be no motherfucking accident. You understand me? And I'm a grad student getting an education, at which point he reached for his gun. And I said, shit. And the officer behind him reached for his gun. And all of a sudden, you heard, we found him. And they said, what? And we found him. He said, you, look, you fit the description, that's OK. And they left. No apology, no nothing, just left. So that happens. And this isn't about police being bad, because they're not. I've had some police who have saved my life. Is everybody with me so far? Oh, they have. I'm going to be honest. There was a moment. Can I tell you one more story? I'm sorry. Yeah. I'll make it fast. Uh, there was a moment in my life when I was in uh, undergrad. Uh, I was in my senior year, and I was depressed. I was, because I didn't think anybody loved me. Because I grew up in a world where your father really never said I love you. He would just show you by making food or trying to help you out. Is everybody with me so far? I didn't think I was loved. So I drank a lot. And I was very abusive to myself, dig? And that's a part of reality. So I got pulled over for drunk driving, totaled the car. And I remember the cop pulled me out. She handcuffed me. Thank God she saved me. I looked at that thing half drunk. And I said, I shouldn't be out. The car was smashed. And they took me to jail. And I kept saying, don't call my father, don't call my father, don't call my father. And I was in Ohio, so he had to drive him from Louisville. And I remember when he had to come to school and get me, he was hell on wheels. He going to have to drive those four hours to see me? I'm about to get my ass doubly beat. So I go to the, the box with the phone, and my mother's over there, and she's beside herself. She's out of her mind. My father looked at me and said, you all right? I said, yeah. He said, all right, we got you. You're going to be fine. And I realized he fucking loved me. You understand? But the funny thing happened, so I, I go, I go, and I'll stop. I'm sorry. I go, I go, and I'm, we're eating our first meal. I hate fish. Can't stand it. You know what I'm saying, Mom. I don't like fish. And the fish sandwich shows up, and I'm sitting in, the, in, the, in the, uh, uh, my tier, my cell block. Yeah, I'm hard. You know, you're trying to be your hard shit, right? I was like, yeah. I had my Richard Pryor like, yeah, my best black shit. Didn't work. <laughs> that fish sandwich came. I crumbled like a mid middle class suburban black kid. I said, oh, what is this? And they were like, fish sandwich. I said, and I literally, for real, this is not a lie. I looked around the table, and there was one brother. He was the biggest one, and he clearly ran the tier. And I was like, and he said, fuck you looking for? I said, what? He said, fuck you looking for, little nigga? I said, um, I'm looking for the salt and pepper. <laughs> nah. This man looked at me, and he said, hold up. Everybody at the table put their stuff down because he was in charge. He said, check this man out. This little nigga thinks we get condiments. And I was like, condiments? I mean, yes, salt and pepper are condiments. No, they're not salt. <laughs> but I had to go through that to realize someone loved me, which was important. So fast forward, I tell, I tell these stories because it's funny and it's real, right? And to say that anything you see upstairs, usually I've gone through or I have a relationship to because it's very autobiographical. So while I was... Uh, it goes to go back and forward. While I was at uh, the Met and doing all this research, I finally realized why I was really in the tapestry. And it's taken me 10 years to get this far. I realized that there was a man named Jacquard who invented this way of weaving, uh, uh, Jacquard weaving, uh, during the Re French Revolution in 1789-ish, uh, that 30 years later, an English gentleman by the name of Charles Babbage picked up and, and invented what we now know as the computer, because Jacquard's weaving invents what we now know as binary code. Is everybody with me? And I was like, holy shit, holy shit, holy shit. Every time I'm staring at a screen, I'm just staring at a tapestry. So I was like, well, all I got to do is find images that deal with the screen and make them into tapestry. But it had to go deeper than that. I couldn't just pick a picture and weave it, because I work with weavers here in the States and in, in, Paris, or in France. When I was a boy, I'm the youngest of six. And in the kitchen table, in the kitchen, we had a, a, a TV in the corner. For some of you young folks, you're not going to understand what I'm about to say, so just look amused. In the corner, there was a TV. Uh, and I'm from the South, so my father would never call you by your name. He would always call you boy. And when the, when the TV started acting funny, he said, boy, go fix that. And he was a college-educated man, MIT in the 50s. But he would break his, his code. He would code switch. He would say, boy, 
put your fork down, go fix that. And I go over there and try to fix it. But I'm a jokester. And I realized I had power. I was God. I could stabilize the image any way I wanted to. At which point I was like, this shit isn't even real. Which means anything they project on the screen is not real. Every time I look on the screen and I see another black man in a mugshot, it's not real. Not that he, didn't, he may or may not have done the crime. That's not the point. But what are the material circumstances that put him in that situation to do the fucking crime? To quote Nina, Mother Nina says, I don't care about that. All I want to know, what are the conditions that produce the situations to make a song like that? You hear me? That's what I'm talking about. What are the conditions that make that possible? So I started building an archive, and we only have like three images left, and we'll be done. Hmm? I have a ton of images at home, in my studio, on my phone. And this is one I found. This is an FBI file that now you, it's free source now, but when I found it, you couldn't have it, so I had to find a certain way to get it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what do you see? What do you see? This is a real question. Ask the group, ask the team, ask the family. What do you see? Speak up, be stupid. Be, be like me, I am dumb as hell. Huh? The black, the, the black guy, oh yes, they have no pants on, yes. What else do you see? The white guys or? <laughs> there we go, okay. There's a white officer, there's a black officer, and there's a lineup. So, this is from the 70s, early 70s, I believe Philadelphia, and this is what they used to do. They would raid black neighborhoods, pull them out, paramilitary style, because some of these guys came back from the war and they implemented that militaristic structure on the community. And they would strip them naked so that they could say, oh, well, we just got to make sure you're not armed. And Eldridge Cleaver went through this. He tells that story where he and the, and the Black Panthers are in this house at a shootout and they realize they are fucking licked, man. It's like the, the, the Indians have lost and the Cowboys are about to win. You, you give up. You surrender. So Elder's getting butt naked, right? He getting, you know, and the kid next to him is like 14. He's like, what are you doing? He's like, get naked, man, so we can surrender. And you know, when you're young, you're insecure about yourself, right? You're going through puberty, you're insecure. He takes his shirt off. Elder says, no, man, you got to get straight naked, because if you don't, when we get out there, they're going to kill you. And he said, I can't, I'm really scared. He walks out. They kill him. They don't kill Eldridge. You understand? These are the consequences of being black and being regulated a certain way. While doing that, I start to realize that, well, we got two images, good. Uh, that there are a series of gestures that, that have been uh, qualified in black existence, and one of them is your hand being raised. Now, Black Lives Matter, which I appreciate, did not invent hands up. If we, if we and you'll see it upstairs, this is the, one of the signature pieces, I guess. One of the biggest gestures in, in black social life, not just American, okay, black social life is the hands being up. And you'll see upstairs that in African sculptures, hands are raised, as well as in contemporary space, hands are raised. Is everybody with me so far? I then believe I take these things, like this one on the bottom right, which is Martin Luther King, and I make iterations of them. So you'll, I don't have this one upstairs, but I believe that images have meanings that can change if you change their circumstances. Is everybody with me so far? So if the image is woven, what happens when it becomes paper? Dig? Dig? Yeah. Okay. So let's end, shall we? Where is, uh, yes, okay. So I will end with something that I believe is very important. Don't play until I say play, please. There is something about the black mother that is necessary for this world. Because it's black women, you hear me? It is black women that are carrying us. Black men are trifling. Black women are the ones carrying us. And there's one in particular who is my surrogate mother. Her name is Nina. Can we play Mother Nina? Because she says something about the power of liberation. Let's see if we can get that to play. That's it. That's what I'm trying to do for you all, and for myself too. I'm trying to give us a new way of seeing things. And have no fear. No fear. Lots of children have no fear. If we can just go back to that space, well, shit, I think we have something. Thank you.